Paleontology is both a fascinating and frustrating science. And whilst we're incredibly lucky to have found what we have so far about Earth's history and the life that existed on it, the amount of missing information can either be intriguing or infuriating, depending on your outlook. Some prehistoric animals, in fact, are not only famous for how annoying they are, they're actually named after it, such as today's Spinosaurid. It was the mid-90s. You couldn't turn your head without hearing NSYNC in one ear and Backstreet Boys in the other. Curtains were a brand new hairdo that wasn't making any sort of comeback, and Rupert Wilde of the State Museum of Natural History in Stuttgart, Germany, had received word of a potential new giant reptile from the rocks of Brazil. Eventually, he got his hands on the specimen for a closer look after buying it from fossil dealers who had acquired it themselves. Initially, this was believed to be the partial skull of a pterosaur, so pterosaur experts were called in to take a closer look, namely David Martil and Eberhard Frey. Now, they initially agreed with the notion that this was a pterosaur, but a closer inspection and collaborative study from peers soon showed that this was in fact a theropod dinosaur, which is why peer review is important. But this was not the only thing that was revealed. Not only was this a brand new Spinosaurid, a group that remained shrouded in mystery and had only just received a resurgence in interest thanks to the relatively recent discovery of Baryonyx, but it also turns out that these fossil dealers hadn't been totally honest about how seamlessly it went from excavation to the museum's hands. In fact, the state of this skull that was truly revealed through CT scans was so bad that Martil and his team broke a cardinal sin of science and led emotion into the equation, naming this new dinosaur Irritator Challengeri. Now, as you're soon going to see, you can't really blame them. But first, let's take a more up-to-date look at Irritator. Now, nothing more than this skull has been officially assigned to Irritator, but some skeletal remains do potentially belong to the genus, and judging how closely related it was to other Spinosaurids that we have managed to find out so much more about in recent years, we have a pretty good idea now about how it would have looked. Spinosaurids are split into two main subfamilies, Spinosaurines and Baryonychines. I've explained in much more detail what the differences between these two are in my Spinosaurid video, but Irritator fell onto the Spinosaurine side, which were generally slightly larger and supported some form of that famous sail. Well, I say they were generally larger, because Irritator is actually the exception to this rule, being actually one of the smallest Spinosaurs at just 6 to 7 meters, or 19.8 to 23 feet in length, and around a ton in weight. Now, bone histology studies and a lack of fusing in certain parts of the skull shows that this was actually a subadult, being close to full maturity, but not quite finished in terms of growing. As to whether we can really estimate the size of a proper adult, that all depends on the potential synonymy with another Spinosaurid, but I will get back into that. Like its relatives, Irritator had a long and narrow skull, conical spear-like teeth, and a secondary palate. A feature not often seen in theropod dinosaurs that would have allowed it to swallow and breathe at the same time. Atop the skull sat a small crest that would have likely played a role in communication, be it showing off or simple recognition, with a much larger structure further along the back. Well, likely. Again, the exact extent or shape of the famous sail for Irritator is unknown, but it does remain likely that this guy was rocking some sort of sail given how common they are in this subfamily. Another feature it likely shared, though not as extreme as seen in Spinosaurus itself, is a distinctive ratio between the size of all four limbs when compared to other theropods, with very large three-fingered claws on the forelimbs and relatively short hind limbs. These features combined with the conical teeth, secondary palate, long snout and potentially fluked tail meant that we have a pescivore, being able to use those massive claws to gaff fish out of the water and the conical teeth to spear those slippery suckers. One recent discovery from this was one I mentioned in my Christmas special when it was discovered back in 2023, in which it was found that the lower jaws were capable of rotating ever so slightly outwards, in a similar fashion to pelicans. As if these mouths weren't horrifying enough. So with this much information on the animal that we now have, what made Irritator so... irritating? Well, it's all to do with that original holotype specimen, and how much money that those moustache-twirling fossil dealers wanted to leak out of it. 
Fossilization is a pretty rough process, so the condition of the remains isn't always favorable in representing the animal truly in life. When it comes to the monetary value of such finds, the worse the preservation, the lower the price. And this was no different in the case of the irritator skull that was found. It was literally in pieces. So they just glued it back together. Thankfully though, fossil dealers aren't really able to fool anatomy experts indefinitely. They just had to do it long enough so that they can get away with the money. It was soon found that parts of the maxilla, which is the upper jawbone, had been stuck on the front of the rostrum, or the snout, using car body filler, artificially increasing its length with the same material filling in the cracks throughout the middle of the skull. To further disguise their deception, they also artificially submerged part of the skull in a plaster matrix, pretending it was part of the rug that they pulled it out from. This also concealed the fact that they had not only attempted and failed at some kind of acid preparation, but had also snapped the very end of the snout and lower jaw off, since it didn't show any signs of erosion. Thankfully, the deception was soon discovered and fixed, and hopefully the so-called dealers hung their heads in shame. Probably not, though. Despite being fixed, however, the problems that Irritator presented didn't stop there. What Irritator lacked in a snout was made up for by another Spinosaurid from this formation who showed nothing but this missing puzzle piece, which was then named Angiterema. Now we know that this wasn't from the same individual, since it is comparatively bigger, but it's been argued to this day as to whether or not we are looking at a snout tip from the larger Angiratama, or the snout tip of a fully grown irritator, and Angiratama never existed. Now if you ask me, I think it's the latter. As I always say in this situation how unlikely it is that two animals of such a similar nature and size can exist in the same ecosystem at the same time. Sure, they might have had a few differences that we can't currently see, or they didn't quite overlap in a formation that lasted a few million years, but we won't know for sure without new information. Speaking of that environment, Irritator was found in the Romaldo Formation of Brazil, which was deposited during the early Cretaceous around 110 million years ago. Whilst the shape of South America and Africa looked more or less the same, their placement was very different, having only just begun to split from each other as the Atlantic was opening up. The most northeastern part of Brazil was still barely connected to southwestern Africa, meaning that there were many coastal areas that one could cross just about. Despite how dry and arid the surrounding areas were, housed here were a few small tropical forests that were fed by coastal lagoons, being fairly synonymous with the same parts of Brazil today. Living alongside Irritator were a variety of aquatic animals, from clams and sea urchins, turtles, small sharks, gars, guitarfish and morsoniids. Dominating the land, or, well, air, were pterosaurs, such as Tapayara, Anhangyera, Caribi Draco, Tiaridactylus, Thalassodromaeus, and Tropiognathus. Running around fully on the ground were a couple of crocodilomorphs, such as Caribisuchus and Oripisuchus, along with a surprisingly scarce number of dinosaurs. Only theropods are known from this area, likely thanks to the relatively scarce number of plants, with said theropods likely feeding primarily on either the aquatic organisms or carrion that washed up here. These include Eratosaurus, Morischia, Cernotanoraptor, as well as an unnamed Unendulin dromaeosaur and a Megaraptorid. Much like many of the other theropods here, Irritator would have spent its time patrolling the lagoons and beaches, snapping up a variety of the aquatic life here and snacking on the odd carcass it came across. I've got to say, I don't find this guy quite as annoying but you can let me know if you agree down in the comments below whilst I answer today's questions, the first of which comes from Dreadval Planix, who has asked How come we still have the family Troodontids if the genus or species it's named after is dubious? Hmm. Yeah, why indeed? Now, taxonomical nomenclature has some very, very strict rules except when it doesn't. To be quite frank, Tyrannosaurus rex shouldn't actually be a thing if we're following the exact rules of taxonomy, but its cultural impact has meant that an exception to the rule was made, which is an example of these confusing double standards that I spoke about here. With regards to Troodontids, yes, the genus of Troodon is kind of dubious and argued over by many paleontologists, since the holotype specimen is literally a couple of teeth. However, a lot of other species have been assigned to the genus from more complete remains. 
with how much disagreement there is over whether the type genus should be valid or not, it's just easier and more concise for now to refer to this group as troodontids. Uh, our next one comes from Elaldo2382, who has asked, perhaps an uncomfortable topic, okay, um, but given the armor and spikes of ankylosaurs and stegosaurs, how do we think they went about mating? Is the answer just carefully, or are there theories of how they got around this? Keep up the good work, your content is always a delight. Thank you. Um, it's a delight to have you watching and submitting these questions. Uh, also, yes, this might be an uncomfortable topic uh, for some, but not for me. It is also a genuinely valid zoological question. How did animals as big and strangely shaped as dinosaurs do it? Well, for some it's more straightforward than others. But you are right, the ankylosaurs and stegosaurs are some of the more challenged groups when it comes to making more of themselves. It could be the very simple answer of very carefully, but that seems more trouble than it's worth when we see the other ways around it today, especially considering how surprisingly delicate the back plates of stegosaurs were. One of the leading theories is that these guys would have mated by joining Cloacla while staying on all fours and kind of facing away from each other, aligning up their parts. Another proposal is that some females may have laid on their side, but this may also be pretty difficult for animals like ankylosaurs, since those wide bodies would have made it pretty difficult to get back up, plus the short legs making it difficult to actually rear up. So it could either be side by side or back to back using some fairly mobile and flexible genitalia, but it does remain possible that it was simply in some freaky position that we've never seen in modern nature before and will likely never know. As always, I appreciate you submitting those questions, even if you think that they might be a little bit uncomfortable to talk about. Again, not for me. Uh, so if you do have a question that you want to submit, head over to the community tab where you'll find the post where I'm taking all the questions just so I can get them all organized. Um, other than that, if you could please leave a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already and did enjoy this video, I can catch you guys next time.